When a user experiences an error in an application, the engineers who are building that application need to find out why that error occurred. The root cause of that error may be on the user's device or within a piece of server-side logic or hidden behind some kind of black box API. To fix a complex error, we need a stack trace of contextual information so that we can correlate events across all layers of an application. James Smith is the CEO of Bugsnag, a company that makes crash reporting and error tracking software. In this episode, James describes how to diagnose errors in modern applications. He also explains how the company Bugsnag functions and how the product itself is built. Bugsnag consumes and stores millions of events, which makes for a good discussion of software architecture in a high-throughput environment. Full disclosure, Bugsnag is a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Cloudflare runs 10% of the internet, boosting the performance and security of millions of websites. Many of you probably already use Cloudflare on your sites, but we're not talking about using Cloudflare today. We're talking about building on top of it. If you're a developer, you can build apps which can be installed by the millions of sites which rely on Cloudflare. You can even sell your apps. They can make you money every month. Your users can log in or register to your service inside your app. They can get a real-time preview of your tool live on their site, and they can start paying you monthly, all from within Cloudflare apps. They can go from never having heard of you or your service to having it installed on their site and paying you in seconds. Visit cloudflare.com slash sedaily to watch how you can build and deploy an app in less than three minutes. That's cloudflare.com slash sedaily. Thank you to Cloudflare for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. James Smith is the CEO at Bugsnag. James, welcome back to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for having me again, Jeff. So last time we talked a little bit about crash reporting and how that's useful. And today I'd like to talk about error diagnosis and resolution, which I think is related to crash monitoring and crash reporting, but it's not exactly the same thing. So let's say I've got a web application, a user experiences an error or a crash of some kind, if I'm the developer, how do I find out that that error occurred? Right, yeah, you're right. The, there's, crash reporting is kind of a subset of errors in general. Uh, there's plenty of tools out there, historically logging services, that would tell you when an exception or a crash had happened. And modern days, tools like Bugsnag and other error reporting solutions. But there's a bunch of other errors or, or issue states that can arise. We actually wrote a blog post about this recently, this kind of frustration detection concept. So... There'll be situations where you're, maybe something won't render correctly on the screen. It doesn't throw a crash, but maybe a dialog window renders off screen. Or maybe the fonts haven't loaded and therefore you can't read anything on the page. Or customers are mashing a button and it's not doing anything when you click it. Hmm. Actually, the, these, this latter set of problems is relatively new that people are trying to solve these kinds of problems. So hmm. these ones we, we've kind of addressed recently with this concept of like frustration detection. One of our engineers here built in a little plugin for Bugsnag that, that detects rage clicks on our <laughs> JavaScript application. And so there's, there's all these proxies that you can use to effectively say, well, is the user experiencing something bad right now? There's other situations as well, which we see a lot, especially on client-side applications where the application freezes. So in Android land, people familiar with Android developer development will, will know about ANRs, Android not responding. And... This is when the main thread or the UI thread is doing too much work or gets stuck and makes your application completely unresponsive. And again, that's not typically something that would throw an exception, but it is a problem that is a bug. It is an error that someone's going to be frustrated by. Mm. So, yeah, it's kind of a new space. I think ANRs and, and timeout and performance detection is, is just getting started. And all the stuff we're playing around with in terms of frustration detection, like rage click detection, or like on a single page JavaScript application, if someone hits Command R, Control R to refresh the page, that normally means something's gone wrong. 
And so there's all these like proxies that you can use to detect this stuff. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So when an error occurs, how much context can I get about the state of the application, the operating system, and the device? And how much do I typically need? Because you know, you, if, if you took a snapshot of the entire operating system, you know, under some circumstances, that might be what you need in order to diagnose an error. But if you're trying to develop a tool where that information gets shuttled from the user, and you know, if you're the developer, the user has some kind of crash or some error, and you need all the information you can get. Well, I guess first, first we should talk about how much context you can get at any given time. And then I guess we can talk about how much context you actually want to retrieve. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. I think that it depends how you're monitoring this kind of stuff. If you're using a runtime error monitoring of some kind, so tools like Bug Snag or in the APM space, something like New Relic, that means that you're likely running an agent or a library that's inside of the code when an error state happens. And so one of the cool things about that is that you can capture pretty much anything that the application knows about. So if you are trying to figure out which user saw a crash, presumably you've authenticated and therefore that user information is available in the application at runtime. And also almost always you can get information about devices, operating systems, CPU, memory, other apps that are running at runtime, depending on your platform. Mm. And I think you're absolutely right. I think that one of the hardest parts about actually doing something in, with errors is, is reproducing them before you can fix them. And I think we discussed this last time, but the the rise of client-side development over the past five years or so has meant that environments are now vastly different between even between two different Android phones, for example, or two different browsers. And so as much context as you can get is our kind of philosophy on Bugsnag land. So capturing the operating system information, the device information, user information, memory usage, disk usage, everything that, that will help you try and reproduce. It's especially prevalent where, again, I keep using Android as an example because there's such a diverse set of devices out there. You can have a client that's on the brand new Nexus phone or the, the S8, or you can have a client that's on an eight-year-old phone that, that was only released in China, for example. And they have massively differing sets of specifications in terms of hardware. But actually also vendors and Android, the people like HTC, for example, fork Android and actually make modifications to the core operating system. So it's kind of a bit like the Wild West. You have to, the more context that you, you have and can get, the better and easier it will be to reproduce and fix a bug. But mm. in, in almost all situations, client side, server side, you can get at runtime a ton of information. Hmm. So uh, another topic that I wanted to dive into eventually, but I think we should fast forward is how you build Bugsnag or how you build any kind of crash reporting or error monitoring tool. So you just mentioned that you want to get as much information as possible. So let's say you have a client, there's a client side application and a crash occurs and you want to take a snapshot of as much information as possible and send it to Bugsnag, which is, you know, you, the information would be sitting, would be get thrown on a server somewhere. So is it not onerous to take all of the information, to, to take all you can eat and, and throw it on a server somewhere? It's expensive. It's one of these things where probably, I don't actually have any real statistics here, so I'm just going to make mm. something up, but I imagine that 99.9% .9 of crash reports that are on Bugsnag servers have never been viewed. I think that in terms of individual errors, a lot of the time you can just look at a, a representative crash report and dive straight into the stack trace. A lot of those errors can can be fixed pretty quickly. You'd be like, oh, oops, I didn't initialize this variable. That's a super easy one. Right. But for us, I think that it's so important to capture all of this context all the time because those 0.1% or 1% of crash reports that are really, really, really hard to reproduce are the ones that actually developers end up spending the most time on. And so while we capture as much as possible, I imagine that most of them don't actually ever get dived into or, or dug deep into due to the fact that they're easy enough to reproduce with the, the most simple stack trace in general. But yeah, it's our crash reports that we collect on the server side, I think average around 10 kilobytes in size. So each, it's not like we're just incrementing a number and sending a small stack trace across. Each crash report is pretty decent in size, and also, in terms of context and diagnostic data, we collect all the stuff that we think could be useful across different devices So and across different customers. So, you know, I said earlier, like memory usage, disk usage, which user was logged in, 
But there's some information that we can't automatically capture. For example, what customer organization or what was the plan tier that the customer who saw the crash was on? Was it like premium versus free? Just because it's not something that we have access to, it's probably available at runtime. Mm. And so what we allow our customers to do is to, I think a lot of other service, services do this as well, but set custom metadata. So not only do we capture diagnostic data that we think is applicable to everyone, but at runtime, our devs can add additional diagnostic data. So in some situations, we have quite significant sized payloads coming in. Hmm. I'd like to discuss the role of a developer that is diagnosing an error or debugging today and get a picture of the tools that somebody is typically using because there's lots of stuff you can buy off the shelf. There's lots of open source projects. What role do logs and monitoring tools play in modern error, error diagnosis? Like, What is the tool set that a typical developer who's debugging an issue is dealing with? Yeah, so it kind of depends on the stage or phase of the deployment process. I think that for when you're developing a piece of software or a new release, you're going to be used to using the, the tools that you have on your computer. So for client-side development, you're probably using the Android Studio application. If you're doing server-side development or like building a Rails app, you're going to get really used to the Rails console and the Rails logs and all the tools that are designed for development work. I think when you get to production, the scale and volume of information captured suddenly changes. So rather than you being the only consumer of your application in development mode, once you send it out to production, volume becomes a problem. You have tens of thousands or millions of crash reports coming in suddenly. And so historically, I think that people still use logging. It's still very popular, but historically logging was the go-to here. And so obviously this relies on you as a developer remembering to instrument your application, remembering to put in log statements at the appropriate places or, or in the try-catch statements, for example, in your application. Mm. Logging has kind of suffered historically from not providing a lot of diagnostics or context when you send a log statement. It relies on the developer remembering to put a statement in, and it relies on that statement being helpful, which is you know, when you're writing code, sometimes you're like, ah, we'll, ne we'll never get into this state. This is never going to happen. <laughs> and so you, I, I don't know if you've, ever, I've actually seen this recently in a mobile app that I was using where a, an error dialogue popped up and said, you should never see this. <laughs> 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 and it, it, it's so prevalent. It's so prevalent. And I think that the idea behind logging is the same. If you, if you don't expect something to, to happen, then you're probably just going to put in a minimum piece of text or string to say, hey, this is bad. Whereas... Hmm. There's kind of been an evolution recently around, as we were talking about a minute ago, the reproducing part and, the, and the, the getting to the root cause of a problem. And I think that logging doesn't really cut it when that happens. And so there's kind of been a rise over the past 10 years of APM, I, I, the kind of performance monitoring side. Mm -hmm. And obviously the space that bugs snagged in, in terms of error monitoring and software quality in general. And I think that one of the things that I've seen is that I'm sure you've seen this as well, but developers and development teams tend not to want to log into logging tools like Splunk or tend not to be the person who, who monitors your APM tool like New Relic. I think that it's kind of the worst case scenario that you log into those systems, whereas the closer you get to the code itself and the closer you get to what you're used to seeing while developing the software, the more likely individual contributors, software developers are to use your tool which is definitely what we've seen. I think that when we roll out Bugsnag, it tends to be the entire development team that wants access and logs in because I think you can improve yourself as a developer by learning about your mistakes. Whereas on logging systems, it tends to be, or APM, it tends to be the ops team that has a login and maybe redirects developers to log in on the occasion when they see something that's critical. Mm. So that's, it's an interesting trend that I've been seeing recently. Spring Framework gives developers an environment for building cloud-native projects. On December 4th through 7th, Spring One Platform is coming to San Francisco. Spring One Platform is a conference where developers congregate to explore the latest technologies in the Spring ecosystem and beyond. Speakers at Spring One Platform include Eric Brewer, who created the Cap Theorem, Vaughn Vernon, who writes extensively about domain-driven design, 
and many thought leaders in the Spring ecosystem. Spring One Platform is the premier conference for those who build, deploy, and run cloud-native software. Software Engineering Daily listeners can sign up with the discount code SEDAILY100 and receive $100 off of a Spring One Platform conference pass while also supporting Software Engineering Daily. I will also be at Spring One reporting on developments in the cloud native ecosystem. I would love to see you there and have a discussion with you. Join me December 4th through 7th at the Spring One Platform Conference and use discount code SEDAILY100 for $100 off of your conference pass. That's SEDAILY100, all one word for the promo code. Thanks to Pivotal for organizing Spring One Platform and for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Getting deeper into some of the issues that developers have to deal with, you know, obviously uninitialized variables and null, null pointer exception type of things. Maybe typos are certainly avoidable errors that happen all the time, and debugging those is, is kind of trivial as long as you have a good piece of tooling in place. But there are more complex and difficult to solve issues, and I'd like to talk through a few of those and sort of get a picture for how much the tooling assists with solving these kinds of issues these days. These are just some issues that kind of I've I've identified as I've been talking to people. So one is this issue of tail latency, which is where, you know, occasionally you have this problem with a user, a user's request doesn't get served in, in kind of the latency that you expect. And it's really hard to diagnose what the issue is, because it sometimes it goes really deep into the stack. But, you know, one way or another, it's, it's, it's this issue of tail latency. And the 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 word tail refers to statistical tail. It's, it's a very rare event. So right. this issue of tail latency, how are people diagnosing this and solving issues with tail latency these days? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Again, it's something that we, we actually blogged about recently in terms of worst case scenario detection. There's kind of two scenarios here as, as far as I've seen. One of them is the kind of easier to diagnose and one of them is the super hard to diagnose. The easier to diagnose ones tends to be when there's a really, really long running request on the network or infinite loop or recursion problem in your code. And typically, if you set up something such that you can get a stack trace at any point in time in your application, what you can do is, even in tools like Bugsnag, you can set like a system timer. So in JavaScript, there's a, there's a I forget what it's called now, but there's a, there's a bunch of performance and timing tools that, that you can use that are supported by most browsers that that will set, you can say things like, hey, if a page load takes longer than this, then let's go and grab a stack trace and see what was happening at that point in time. And so in that case, in the simple situation, a stack trace is quite often enough. You can be like, hey, well, the top frame on the stack trace was that we were doing an HTTP request, or the top frame on the stack trace was that we're in this function and this function has been running for 20 seconds. And this should return in milliseconds or nanoseconds. And so when it's a simple case like that, it's quite easy to diagnose if you set up timers. And you can. there's a bunch of ways to do this. But in a Java app, for example, you can spawn a priority thread and almost have a watchdog going on where you keep checking in on your main threads and say, how, how, how's everything going? Are my threads still executing? And this is what Android gives you in terms of ANR at the operating system level. And in JavaScript, there's these timing APIs that are now becoming quite prevalent. On the harder side of the coin is, I wonder if this is what you were hinting at as earlier, is this kind of cross-service dependencies. Yes. I think there's a there's this rise of microservices these days where even us, we're, we're like still a relatively small company here with 35 people on the team, but we have a ton of micro Java microservices processing our crash reports coming in. And what we've done there is we try and tie things together. So what I mean by that is, and this is something, by the way, that's very common in our customers as well. If you have like a primary key of some kind that ties a journey between multiple services. Now, a lot of teams will use like a request UUID. At Bugsnag, we use a user ID or a session ID of an authenticated user because you have to be authenticated to use Bugsnag. So the idea is that if you have that same ID propagated across all of your services, and then you set individual kind of SLAs or timers on each service, 
you can have kind of handled errors. They're not things that have caused the app to hard crash. But you can say, if this request takes longer than five seconds mm -hmm. then in this one service, then send a message out to Bugsnag and attach that user ID. And then what you can do is you can go into your Bugsnag dashboard or a logging service if you're using logging and search for that user ID across the services. So the idea is basically to try and tie services together by some unique ID. That is definitely the harder of the two because it relies on you instrumenting all of your services. And especially if you're a startup and you're trying to move quickly, sometimes you're you'll skip some of those parts of the building and diagnostic process. But yeah, that's the two that I've seen. Uh, the single app one is definitely the easier of the two. That sounds like a combination. The The latter case you described is it sounds like a combination between distributed tracing and the circuit breaker pattern where... Exactly. So like basically if you've got some request along the chain that's taking too long, you fail gracefully and send a crash report somewhere. Exactly. And if you're following the rules of engagement for microservices well, <laughs> microservices in general should have an SLA and a set of rules and an API like, hey, my uh -huh. service is responsible for this and this only. Uh -huh. And it should do that within this period of time. So I think if you're if you're good at following those patterns, then you can get used to implementing the circuit breakers ahead of time and adding your request ID or, or session tracing information ahead of time. You know, another one of these worst case scenario issues is I heard I heard an episode recently, Software Engineering Radio, which is a different podcast, but it's the one I based this one off of. But the episode was about this horrible bug that PagerDuty had that was really hard to solve. And essentially the bug came down to some sort of really low-level TCP issue that occurred within ZooKeeper. So it oh, was... Wow. Yeah, and so, you know, ZooKeeper is one of these things that you just take off the shelf and you use it in some of your, you know, your technologies or or in the past people would do that. It's not so popular anymore for I think for new technologies, but the story of debugging this was completely nightmarish and but I I did take it to be representative of a broader case of kinds of bugs where, you know, you're using like a database off the shelf or you're using a framework off the shelf and as far as you know, this is like a black box and some bug you know, keeps occurring. And as far as you know, it's a black box. It, I mean, do you have any approaches or do you have any good stories about, you know, this kind of issue where there's a black box, maybe like React would be a, a reasonable example of a framework that's, you know, that's recently gotten a lot of popular popularity. It's used by a lot of people who probably don't know much about it, which is totally fine. That's the purpose of frameworks. But do you have any thoughts on this, this space of bugs? I think you've, you've nailed it when you talk about maturity here. The kind of maturity level of the software or library that you're using is super critical when it comes to these kind of issues. I remember at my previous company, we were super early adopters of MongoDB. And as you say, as a software developer, you don't really want to have to care about the internals of some third-party service or client. And I remember we were using some pre-version one edition of MongoDB. We bought the hype. I love MongoDB, by the way. I think it's great. I know it gets a lot of hate these days, but I still think it's excellent for uh, JSON document payloads and unstructured data. But we had this bug where it was literally crashing due to us structuring the data in a particular way. So the I guess it was the B-tree type of index that they were using was just not designed for the type of data and indexing that we were doing. And so we had the situation where our database would just fall over and it would then flip to the secondary and then the same query would come through and then the secondary would fall over, which oh. was terrifying. It was, you know, this is pr in production, large deployment. And you worked at a finance company, right? This was in between actually. Oh, okay. This was a, I, yeah, I, I worked at Bloomberg for a, for, for a while building trading platforms there, but in between I was the, the first employee and CTO at this company called HayZap, which is kind of a mobile gaming company. And at one point, I forget how many, we had millions of millions of active users using this mobile application. And the API was powered by Mongo. So yeah, it was, it was like, what do we do when that happens? And to make matters worse, Mongo's logs weren't being flushed to disk before the crash happened. Oh. So basically, the, there was no idea, you had no idea what query was being serviced at the point in time a crash happened. Now they updated this, and because this is super early on, they fixed that, they made sure that the logs were getting flushed. But it was just like, well, okay, how do we solve this? So we actually had to add application instrumentation and literally line up timestamps to see what request was happening to cause the database to crash. Hmm. I have a kind of a, I guess, subjective philosophy on this. And 
and maybe it's because I'm uh, kind of going a bit further and a bit older in my career now. But if you're building anything that's designed for production scale and production quality, pick a technology that's been around for a while and it's pretty tried and tested. Like we break that rule occasionally here at Bugsnag, but most of the time we're using tools and technology that are in use by companies like Google or have been scaled, uh, 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 huge organizations have been in production for years. Mm -hmm. It's not cool, it's not sexy as they say uh, when you're setting up a startup, but it, it does save you a lot of pain in the ass basically. Mm -hmm. We had that problem with Node as well with network request timeouts. So we decided to get all aboard on the new technology train. <laughs> mm. Interesting. But I think that application logging is the, uh, sorry, service logging is the only real way you can see what's going on before these services die. It pains me every time I have to open someone else's log file, it's especially in the, the SaaS world where you just want to hopefully things just work, you know. Let's put it this way. If you're using AWS and you're using Amazon's RDS service, it would be an absolute disaster if you had to try and look in the log files for <laughs> RDS. I don't even think they have them, right? It's Maybe they have slow query logs or something like that, but you expect these services to just work. And so I think we're almost in that world these days. But I don't know. It, it pains me to think about it, even digging into Zookeeper logs. Yeah, well, at least Zookeeper will be open source. The the Redshift one would be, or the RDS one would be, that would be too much. Exactly. So I want to get into discussing Bug Snag and then a discussion of building Bug Snag. And throughout that, we can talk about some of the other problems in this space that you're solving for developers. So let's start by just, just just talking about what Bug Snag does, because we I think we've kind of been referring to it tangentially, but describe what Bug Snag does. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we've built this platform that detects when software breaks, basically. And more specifically, we will hook into exception handlers at the language level or at the framework level. Exceptions is, is the broadly used term, but because we support, I think, now 40 different platforms, some languages like Go, for example, would talk about panics or in old school PHP, you would talk about errors. And so we kind of hook into these bad situations that, that often have a hook at the application or framework level. And so you install a library, it's like a, uh, they're all open source, they're all on GitHub, that detects these error states and then captures this diagnostic data as we were talking about earlier. And then what we do is we, we capture that stack trace, the diagnostic data, error information, send it off to our servers where we aggregate and group by root cause. So the idea is that we're saying, hey, if you're in production, this error, this exception, isn't just going to happen once, probably. It's going to happen in a consumer mobile app. It might happen a million times. So taking that information, aggregating, grouping by root cause, so that you can then say, well, hang on, this error, this bug happened a million times. It's still happening. Let's go ahead and fix it in our next release. And so really the what we build is kind of the, the tools and platform to detect these situations, prioritize them, and then fix them. The prioritization step, and I think is the kind of secret source here. I think that a lot of developers we speak with say, oh, I built my own tool for this. And I've seen some really cool homegrown tools for this. I mean, obviously, Bugsnag at one point felt a lot like a homegrown tool when we first started the company. But in reality, I think that when you're at scale, when you're seeing a ton of crashes, you can't fix every error. We've got a bunch of companies in the consumer mobile space. And when a bug goes out and affects all of your customer base, you need to know about that. And you can't go through, as I was saying earlier, we probably have 99% of our crash reports aren't actually fully dived into. You can't go through each individual crash report, which is what logging systems kind of want you to do. So what we do is we say, hey, all of these crash reports are the same problem. And here's the prioritization stack and the tooling to connect into Jira or Slack or whatever you use right now to figure out if you should fix it and then go ahead and fix it. Hmm. So that's that's kind of the, the, the idea behind it. It's all production code as well. You can run it in development, but as I said, it's best to stick to the tools that you're used to using that, that your platform or language provides. Hmm. And so I think you, you're kind of talking about the UI is the secret sauce, like the UI is really important. What is the user interface that a developer wants for this kind of tool? Can you just describe, like, because you kind of have to, like, ex explain to a developer, like, this is a thing that you actually want because okay, you've already got a million tools that you're using. And so in order to convince a developer that this is something that they want, you have to say, okay, this is actually going to save you time. It will subtract more time from the other tools or, or services that you're using 
than it will add to your current workflow. So what's that value proposition? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, at the basic level, if someone's never used a tool like Bugsnag before, I always say, hey, you know when you are writing the software in development and you see a crash and you have a beautiful stag trace, you can now get that on production. That's like the bare minimum that we provide. And I think most, most people who know about Bugsnag know that that's a thing. But actually, I think I would say a lot of software developers don't know that production error monitoring is, is even a thing yet. The so you're saying, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but you're saying like, yeah, so, so stack trace meaning, so I'm like testing my app locally, it crashes, oh, I get a stack trace, that's great. But when a user is testing it, I don't typically get the user's stack trace and you're just describing it at a bare minimum. Now you get when your users crash the stack exactly. trace that they have. Yeah, in the wild, for, like when, when, you, when you take it out of the little sandbox that you're building in, you send it to your real customers, mm. people are going to see a crash, that's just a fact of life. But what was the crash and what line of code did it originate from, I guess, is, is the nuts and bolts here. So that's the, that's the basic MVP. What we actually see being more of a driver for why teams, engineers and managers, and even higher up than that, adopt Bugsnag and tools similar to Bugsnag is, hey, actually, we know that we have crashes. We want to get the strike a balance between quality and new features, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So if you, especially if you're a startup or if you're even a, a huge company, we've got a lot of large companies using us these days, you almost want to find the sweet spot. Like there are some errors that it probably doesn't make business sense to fix. Or there's some errors that are happening in such weird situations. I'll give you an example here. If people jailbreak their iPhone and disable the camera feature after you've given an app official permission in iOS to say, allow access to the camera, the developer can mostly safely assume the camera should be available and camera API should work. But if you're in a jailbroken environment and someone's disabled that, then it won't work. And so as a developer or engineering manager, you can probably say, well, I don't care about that crash. And so the idea is here to try and find that sweet spot between developing new features and providing value to your customers and fixing the bugs that matter. And it's this tension, I think, that exists in every product team. If you're planning your sprint, for example, in Jira or whatever tool you're using, you're saying, right, we need to release these cool new features. But before we get to that, which bugs do we need to fix? And mm -hmm. I think that's a I think that's a kind of daily struggle with teams. And even in large companies and larger teams, what we're seeing is that let's say you're a monolithic application or you're one application that has multiple teams building parts of that application. Your question is even more specific and your question might be, what are the worst bugs that is in the part of the application that I own? Let's say you're, you own the payment screens in a mobile application. Maybe the payments team only cares about those screens and maybe they're higher priority and maybe they want to find the worst bugs there. So basically really honing into what should I be working on next? Grammatech Code Sonar helps development teams improve code quality with static analysis. It helps flag issues early in the development process, allowing developers to release better code faster. Code Sonar can easily be integrated into any development process. Code Sonar performs advanced static analysis of C, C, Java, and even raw binary code. Code Sonar performs unique data flow and symbolic execution analysis to aggressively scan for problems in your code. Just like battleships use sonar to detect objects deep underwater, engineers use Code Sonar to detect subtle problems deep within their code. Go to go.grammatech.com/sedaily to get your free 30-day trial exclusively for Software Engineering Daily listeners. Code Sonar analyzes your code and it delivers a detailed report. The Code Sonar user interface provides all the information that you need to quickly understand the reports, follow cross functional paths, understand cross references, quickly navigate between files, and visualize large pieces of your code. Go to go.grammatech.com slash SE daily to get your 30 day free trial and unleash the power of advanced static analysis. Thanks to Grammatech for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Do you 
of a modern perspective on how much testing should be done because so uh, you know i uh, it's like when i was in in school and i took some software engineering courses well actually i took one class that was called software engineering and the professor was so dogmatic about unit tests and i thought dogmatic to the point where it really slowed down the ability for for students in the class to really build stuff and then you know i got out into the wild and, and i did some internships at companies and like none of the companies had thorough unit tests and thorough integration tests and there was just kind of like a little manual testing phase and i was like well <laughs> these companies are clearly like doing it wrong but you know as i went to get more and more companies i found that there was a lot of companies who did not have very thorough testing and and i think part of that is because the professor that I had who really instilled this idea of unit testing into my head, this un- unit testing, integration testing, he came from a time when the the set of cases that you would have to test for was so much more limited. And the applications right. that we build today are like really, really diverse. And they have to deal with a wide spectrum of, of cases. You know, if you talk about like, okay, I'm, I want to build something that, that works for every person in the social graph. And I want to build something that can integrate with a million different SaaS tools. Like, you just can't test everything. And so, like, you know, the way I look at it is there's a lot of tools that kind of let you compromise and not have to test as much. And and one of those is something where you would be able to receive the stack traces from your users when they are crashing. Yeah. Exactly. I'm very opinionated on this to the point where I think that, that a lot of people will get annoyed when I talk about it. But I feel like that like, testing is great. And... We test a lot of Bugsnag and we test the the systems and mission critical parts of Bugsnag. We don't obsess around things like code coverage and we don't obsess around testing absolutely every part of the system. And I think there's a very pragmatic, practical reason for that. So even now, four years into the company, a lot of the products and systems that we build, we don't know if anyone's going to use them, right? So we've got all these customers, maybe we add a new feature. It might be that everybody hates the feature. Normally, it's not the case, but maybe they do. And maybe we just delete that code in a couple months' time because it's no no good just keeping technical debt sitting around. So if a lot of schools of thought will say spend the same amount of time on testing as you do on, on product development, if you're testing a new feature and you spend the same amount of time building that feature as you do building 100% code coverage and unit tests, and it turns out in a month's time that no one actually uses that feature and you're going to kill it, you've spent twice the amount of time building that than you should have done. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of concept of an MVP, I think a lot of companies are building software based on the MVP approach these days, it leads you to kind of taking shortcuts in some cases. Now, on the flip side of that, if you do build something, it is a core part of your software stack and you are going to continue to support it, then I do think it is worth investing time in increasing your test coverage. Now, I'm not a big fan of unit tests. I think unit tests are... In testing, you can only test what you can conceive, right? That's the the shortcoming of testing in general. And so if you say, great, I've got 100% code coverage, that's one way of measuring testing. But in reality, the types of data coming into your modules or units or classes or whatever you're using here are going to vary so wildly that, yes, you might have 100% code coverage, but you don't have 100% environment and data coverage. And that's not even a measurable thing. So... I think that probably my controversial statement is I think code coverage leads to a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. And it also is not often appropriate to spend the extra time on code coverage. Like we'll, we'll unit test our error grouping algorithms and our event reporting transactions and our payment system because Mm -hmm. they're super mission critical for us. But things like buttons in the UI that will mark an error as fixed, we don't have a unit test for that component in react. So Mm -hmm. and that's how, that's the way I think about these things. And, I do agree with you, though, that back in the day when you shipped software using the waterfall model and you delivered it on a CD-ROM, you couldn't go back and test things later and the environments were pretty well controlled. So, yeah, you'd get your QA team to write a test script and go through the tests beforehand each release, but you'd also spend a month on QA. Whereas these days, if you're, again, using consumer mobile apps as an example, almost all of the top consumer mobile apps are delivering a new release once a week or once every two weeks. So you can't spend a month in QA. So you have to kind of find that sweet spot. So yeah, I, I know it's not exactly a, a popular opinion, but I do think that you gotta, you got to strike a balance. Is it that unpopular though? Like as you're talking to other companies, other startups who, you know, CTOs, CEOs who are leading companies, 
I don't know if you if this discussion has come up with them, but you know, is is it something that people actually share in reality? Yeah, people talk about that. We talk about this a lot. I think that it's unpopular because it's not. I mean, you touched on this already. It's not what you're taught in school. I think that a lot of professors. I had this in school as well. A lot of professors will be almost religious about test-driven development. Yeah, and all of these techniques that you you should use in the real world. And so you're, it's gra- ingrained into companies and into software leaders as well, managers. And so it's for us, it's almost like when we get into these conversations, especially with new customers, we almost have to give them a reset. And we have to, we have to basically say, hey, it's okay not to do this anymore. And here's why. And we point to our customers that are doing well by finding that sweet spot between testing and not testing. And so I, I don't think it's necessarily something that people hate, but I do think it's slightly controversial because most of the market still is coming from the background of, hey, test-driven development is the thing that you do, Mm -hmm. or coming from the environment where you didn't have visibility into production, and therefore you had to spend much more time on testing before you went to production. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a a kind of attitude change that's slowly happening, and I think we've we've taken the opinion that we're just going to be stand our ground and say, no, here's here's where it's appropriate in our opinion. Mm -hmm. It seems to resonate pretty well, but it takes some convincing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. So talking more about the way that Bugsnag is built, so sometimes new technologies come out and you need to build a way to instrument the crash reporting, the monitoring, the error triaging for whatever new tool comes out. And I guess I'd like to understand how that works because I know the open source community is involved somehow but like, let's take React Native as an example. This is a fairly, I mean, it's I guess it's a couple of years old at this point, but it's still like pretty cutting edge, and right. there's a lot of like layers to React Native to understand, and I imagine there's a lot of like subtle bugs that people deal with. <laughs> yeah. So can you can, can you can, picked a particularly good example as well here? Right. Okay. So describe describe the evolution or the life cycle of a new like instrument monitoring system for let's take react native as an example. Yeah, absolutely. So we, when a new platform comes out that we've decided that we want to support, we have a team that we call the platforms team here. And up until very recently, that was a very small team as one person. We've been growing that steadily recently. So when we decide we want to support a platform, step one is that we have to become experts in what an error means on that platform. So, in general, we tend to, for supported platforms, we tend to build the first version of this ourselves. And we tend to be quite strict about what we're going to detect, what we're going to capture, and how we're going to deliver it to Bugsnag. And so Delisa, who runs our platforms team, she'll say, right, we're going to support React Native. What does an error mean in React Native? And you've picked a particularly gnarly example, which I love, by the way. There are platforms such as, let's say, Ruby, right, where you can detect an exception very, very easily. There's literally a language hook. At exit, you can look at a variable to see if an exception was thrown. So it's so easy to build a a Ruby crash reporting library. In React Native, for example, there are multiple layers to the platform. So you've got the React Native layer where you're, you're writing effectively JavaScript code, JSX code to define components. And then you have the native mobile layers under the hood. So a crash could happen in one of three places, iOS native, Android native, or React layer on top. Mm -hmm. So even the the, the task of defining what error means in React native was quite a complicated one for us. It's like, well, okay, in order for us to be able to say we do very good React native error monitoring, we have to be able to detect crashes all all the way through that stack. We can't just pick one and then toss it over the fence, which a lot of other people have done. You have to do the whole stack. So step one is defining what an error means. Step two is becoming an expert in how to detect and and, uh, absorb those. And now in the example of React Native, we touched on this earlier today when we were talking about working with mature tools and technologies. React Native is pre-version one still right now. And every time they change the minor version, I think I can't remember what the minor version is now, but it's up in the 30s. We have to come and check, did that affect Bugsnag? Has that broken Bugsnag? And a lot of the time, the answer is yes, because it's pre-version one. There's not a stable API right now. So again, it's a particularly gnarly example. Delisa on my platforms team is, and Jamie, the, the, our new mobile platforms engineer, have to really dive deep into the internals of React Native and understand what's changed. Our philosophy is always that 
in order to use bugs and you should not have to be an expert in errors yourself that's our job and so we really take a long time to find all of these event handlers handlers error handlers and all of the places that we could and should capture diagnostic data mm -hmm. so in the react native case we had to tie in both of our android and ios native crash reporting libraries and build a separate react native la layer on top of those so that one was a that one's a tough one wow and it's, the maintenance of it's really difficult as well don't even get me started with the even lower level layers of this we we have some customers that are using react native on android with android ndk for the c and c plus plus layer on the bottom in which case that can be three different layers on one device react native java and then c c plus plus under the hood so it is a uh, we don't want our customers to have to be experts in error monitoring so we have to put a lot of effort into it but what we try and do then is put these libraries open source so everyone can see hey here's what we learned and here's, mm. the, here's how you can take a look at it Indeed. Okay, cool. Well, that gives me a little bit of a window into how the company operates, and I think I'd like to go a little bit deeper. So we basically discussed what the application monitoring software does. Like it's it sits on your on your user's application. If they have a crash, then it reports it to you, and you can look at those look at all those crashes across this sort of inbox for your bugs, and you can triage them and you can look through you know, this giant repository of, of stack traces and, and kind of sift through them and, and order them and collate them. But I want to understand the server architecture because you've got, cra you've got crash reporting that can come in at any time. You've got, you know, I'm sure you get spikes sometimes. Just give me the, like, the big high-level overview of the software architecture for your company. Yeah, so we, we've got a lot of moving parts. As I hinted at earlier, there's a, a kind of a, a microservice architecture behind the scenes, but to break it down in, a, in the simplest way, we kind of have two main parts of Bugsnag. We have the error pipeline. So the error pipeline is the set of services that is receiving and ingesting crash reports from end user applications. And then we have the dashboard and API. And the dashboard API is how our de developers who have Bugsnag accounts consume that data that we've, we've processed. And to give you a kind of idea of scale, I think we're processing, I, I don't know the exact number now, but it's in the in the billions of crash reports per day. So especially due to the fact that we have all these consumer mobile applications and client-side applications where the order of magnitude of crash reports is a lot higher, we have to deal with these billions of crash reports per day. And you're right, there are spikes just due to the nature of software. If one of our major clients releases a new version of their application that has a major bug in it, we have to be ready and, and able to receive all of those error reports without harming the, the rest of the system. So fundamentally what we have is at the front door of Bugsnag, our notify endpoint is what we call it. We have a, a Go microservice, and this is like 150 lines of code. It is simple, it is tiny, it is robust. And the idea behind this is that, and that runs uh, in a load balanced environment on Google Cloud. Everything in Bugsnag runs on Google Cloud these days. Hmm. And so what we call the event server is this Go service microservice that receives crash reports and then places them onto a queue. And we use RabbitMQ for our queuing system. And once crash reports land on a queue, they are then pulled off the queue by what we call our event worker service. And our event worker service originally was a monolithic node.js application. And over the last couple of years, we've been slowly pulling out pieces of that into Java microservices. So the node part is getting a lot smaller, thank goodness. But the, this kind of pipeline of the event worker and error processing pipeline does kind of varying steps depending on the platform that we receive a crash from. But in the simplest case, we'll say, hang on a second, this is a crash report coming in from a Rails application. We've associated it with an application ID or an API key from the client. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to see, hey, should this be grouped together with any other errors? And should we alert the engineering team that is building this software? Because that's mm -hmm. one of the parts of Bugsnag is we can alert you in real time when an error happens for the first time or gets worse. In the more complicated cases, we have to do a lot more steps in this pipeline. So one of the things I think we discussed briefly last time was there's situations, for example, iOS development, where when you build an application and ship it to your customers, at build time, you will strip debugging information. So what happens is when a crash happens on an iOS, this is to reduce the download size and the binary size and increase performance when running on a client's device. So what happens is when a crash happens on an iOS device, 
you're basically just going to get a memory address. So you're going to you get an error ID or type and a memory address. Mm. And that's not helpful in terms of real debugging. If you're developing an iOS app or in Xcode, when you see a crash, you see all the debugging information, stack trace, all sorts of thread information in there. And so what Bugsnag does is we have to take that memory address and crash ID and tie it together with the original debugging information, which we actually collect at build time. And so we tie them together, which is quite a, you know, intense process in some situations. So recombining memory crash, minimal crash reports with full di diagnostic information and, and stack trace information is another part of that debugging pipeline. And it varies per platform. iOS has DSIM files. Android has ProGuard files. JavaScript and browser JavaScript has source maps because you're going to minify your JavaScript code before you send it to your customers. So if you see a crash report in minified JavaScript, it will say, hey, this crash happened on line one because there is only one line because it's all been squashed up and all the new lines have been. Mm. Whereas in reality, actually in your original source code, it happened on line 4000 in this method number. So it's not acceptable for us to show you the, the garbage crash report, the, the line one or the memory address. It's like table stakes for us to capture the debug information at build time and then recombine that with the crash information collected at runtime. And so all of this stuff happens behind the scenes in these varying microservices. So if you can imagine a pipeline of data where we're like, okay, this is a Rails crash. Cool, let's do the grouping, let's notify and let's save it in the database. But if it's an iOS crash, let's go and fetch the, the decent files. Let's recombine the diagnostic and debugging information. Now let's group it together. Now let's alert you. Now let's save it in the database. It's like a choose your own adventure game inside of our error pipeline. Interesting. You mentioned a couple migrations, and maybe you could talk about whichever one is more interesting. But, well, I, I actually, the first one I'm not sure is a migration. You, you were originally on AWS, right? That's correct, yeah. We actually moved in December last year. We moved everything to Google Cloud. And so, yeah, so go ahead. Well, so I was going to say, you know, I'm curious about that. And I'm also curious about the migration from Node to Java, which is a pretty unfashionable <laughs> migration. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is not. It, it's not trendy, it makes sense. It, I will say it makes it absolutely makes sense to me, especially given your problem domain. Yeah, I mean, the Google Cloud migration for us was we had a bunch of reasons behind doing it, but we Dockerized absolutely everything. So everything mm -hmm. in the that I was just talking about in the stack is all containerized. Right. And Google Cloud has a kind of different attitude to the cloud than AWS does. A AWS tries to be industry standards and tries to do things that are modeled and open source but there's a lot of proprietary stuff happening behind the scenes whereas google's approach seems to be well let's make this feel as much like if you were running these services yourself mm -hmm. but you don't have to run them yourself so for us because we containerize everything and migration from aws to google cloud wasn't a, a crazy difficult thing for us a lot of the services that google cloud provides as well they, they have some really really cool tricks that they've built so in aws if you're running at scale like bugsnag amazon will shut down your instances on occasion and they'll send you an email saying hey on sunday we're going to delete this instance <laughs> so if that's your i know right if, if that's your production master database presumably you've got a high availability set up and you, you you're locked down but it's still going to be a, a bunch of work for your ops team to come in and rebuild that container, pull it up on a new instance or whatever. So mm. Google have bun a bunch of cool things that they allow you to do. So I think Amazon's slowly been introducing these, but one of our favorites is the fact that Google can automatically migrate instances when they're going to shut down a broken or degrading instance. Mm. For me, like under the hood, the amount of work they've had to do to get that working is amazing. It just feels like magic. So the dream of the cloud has always been, let's not worry about the underlying servers and infrastructure that you're running on. And I feel like Google's got a little bit closer to that than Amazon did. Maybe mainly probably because Google went, well, hang on, let's look at everything Amazon did and just fix all the weird things about it. <laughs> yes, so sure. maybe cheating a little bit. No, I mean, that's my kind of my impression of the what's going on there. Okay, so I know we're, we're kind of getting up against time. You know, I'm curious about like even higher level stuff and just company running the company wise thing. So what aspects of the company have been challenging to scale? Yeah, I mean, our product team and our engineering team and our design team has always been like fantastic. We've always known what we're building and where we're going. I think that really some of the hardest things in, in terms of scaling have been 
once you, and it sounds like a, a nice problem to have, but once you get a ton of customers, you have a kind of dilemma between building what your customers are asking for versus building what was in your original roadmap. And a lot of the time, these two aims align really nicely and really closely. And a lot of the time, we'll listen to our customers and pull things forward on the roadmap. But when we, you know, when you're a young company and you're a couple of founders in a bedroom thinking, yeah, we're going to change the world, we're going to build all this stuff, you have a kind of very clear idea of your strategy, you have a very clear idea of where you want to go. And actually, one of the biggest struggles for me, and again, it's actually quite a nice problem to have, is that your customers will give you great ideas and great feedback. And they'll say, well, actually, here's how we're using your product. And sometimes the way your customers are using your product is not one of the problems or, or, or things that you're thinking about when you built the company in the first place. So I guess to make this a bit more tangible, a good example here is, and it seems obvious in hindsight, but my co-founder and I are math and CS grads. We've, we've been software developers for a long time. But one of the biggest use cases of Bugsnag is in support teams, technical support teams. That's not something we set out to solve in the first place. But we, we go on site with customers. We talk to some of our biggest customers and they say, hey, our support team loves, loves this. This is how they're using it. And so we then look at our product and say, well, are we doing a good job for support teams? Is it the right experience for these teams? So as we grow, as we increase the people who are using Bugsnag, we find out about new hats that people are wearing while using the product. And so we kind of like to take a time out and have a pause and say, have we done the best job that we can for this particular customer? So, I mean, it's again, it's a nice problem to have because it means we have great customers who are sharing their feedback with us. But at the same time, it's like, well, that's slightly different to what we set out to build in the first place. Hmm. So that's that's one of the struggles, I think. And I think a lot of people at our scale of startups seem to have the same the same feedback as well. Okay, James. Well, it's been great talking to you once again and really enjoyable conversation, wide-ranging. Yeah, we, we spied it all over the place. It's always fun. Thanks for having <laughs> me on the show, yeah. Thanks, James. Simplify continuous delivery with GoCD, the on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery tool by ThoughtWorks. With GoCD, you can easily model complex deployment workflows using pipelines, and visualize them end-to-end -end with the value stream map. You get complete visibility into and control over your company's deployments. At gocd.org slash sedaily, find out how to bring continuous delivery to your teams. Say goodbye to deployment panic and hello to consistent, predictable deliveries. Visit gocd.org slash sedaily to learn more about GoCD. Commercial support and enterprise add-ons, including disaster recovery, are available. Thanks to GoCD for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Wow! 